Hey everyone, this is Denise Demizi. I am the Director of Faculty Development for the University System of Georgia. And this morning we did a webinar on reflection and I forgot to hit record for the orienting activity. So I thought it would be helpful if I just sort of did a brief overview of what we did this morning before the I hit record because it we talk about it during the webinar and I thought it would help give some context. So when participants came in before the webinar started, they were met with this, this screen, uh, this slide that has four, I'm sorry, eight images on it. And they were invited to choose a picture that best represents their current use of reflective activities in the classroom. So they um, shared the number of the, the picture that corresponded and then briefly described why. So I'll just read a, a handful of the ones that folks put in the chat to give you an idea of some of the responses. So someone said number four, which is a puzzle because I'm trying to get them to put the pieces together. Um, number one, I'm trying to get them to explore in an elevating way. So that's the stairs. Um, let's see, I'm trying to get a good selection of the different pictures. Number eight, because I use reflection as part of my own practice, but I'm trying to figure out how best to incorporate it into my lessons. Excellent. Um, one and four were very popular. And eight, um, let's see. Number two, I like this one. I think this one works for my courses because I have students reflect on ideas that may seem the same, but on closer examination, you see subtle and complex differences. I love that. Um, maybe six, hoping for relating topic to own life to blossom into deeper understanding. Um, let's see. Um, number three, I don't currently use a formal reflective system, which I feel leaves a bit of a hole in utilizing metacognition. Number seven, once students learn the ancillary materials, they will see the tree. So that's just a, an example. There are literally dozens of um, responses here. And again, it just gives, uh, gives you the opportunity to think about your current situation, maybe by using a metaphor, but it also helps to kind of get you out of the moment and all the things that are running around in your brain so that you can really focus in on the topics at hand. Um, and in this case, reflection. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this and we will launch right into the webinar. Thank you, Becky. Okay, so we are now recording. Um, so when Becky and I were talking about this webinar, we realized that we were coming at reflection from slightly different but complementary ways. So we decided to tackle this topic in two parts. So I'm gonna be focusing on reflection and learning, and Becky is going to be reflection, uh, focusing on reflection for perception. So let's just start with what is critical reflection. So Jacoby says, uh, critical reflection is analyzing, reconsidering, and questioning one's experiences within a broad context of issues and content knowledge. So a lot of what I saw in your comments there, analyzing, reconsidering, and questioning one's experiences. And critical reflection doesn't just happen. It takes some careful design to encourage reflection in our students. Um, so if that's the case, why should we do it? Why is it important? So let's see this again in the chat. Um, why is reflection important? Foster's metacognition. Mm -hmm. Helps us snap out of autopilot. I like that. Helps us to improve our thinking, metacognition, self-review. Yes. Um, Connect abstract ideas to the real world, real life. Absolutely. Helps under, students understand why material is relevant to them. Yes, I love that. Exposes us to different perspectives, make connections. Yeah, all these things. This is, this is great. Um, 
a lot of times students don't realize the journey they've been on. Yeah, that's so, I love that because again, if we don't sort of force ourselves or our students to stop and think and reflect, it, it often just doesn't happen. Um, so thank you, that, these are great. Helps faculty to see where students are at. Yeah, so it's a two-way street, right? So it helps us know where their thinking is too. Okay, so make connections, consider, reconsider their beliefs and values, question and gain understanding of their experiences. Pretty much what you all said and what you all said was even more than this. So that's great, thank you. Um, one of the things that I hear people sometimes use information and knowledge interchangeably, but I really think of them as very different Things. So when I think about information, I think it is something that I get from a book, I get from a lecture, I get from a video, it is something that someone has given to me. Um, Terry, whoops, Terry Doyle says that whoever does the work does the learning. And in the case of me presenting this to you, I did the work, right? So I learned a lot in putting this together. But unless you do something to transform that information into knowledge, it's just information. Um, so to get that deeper understanding, you have to recognize connections. You need to be able to see the forest for the trees. Um, and that's also how we can start to move up like on Bloom's taxonomy, for example. So reflection is one of the key ways that this can happen, that we can transform information into knowledge. And research has also found that without reflection, our misconceptions and preconceptions sometimes do not get challenged and are sometimes actually reinforced. So an example is in service learning. So a lot of the reflection, um, a lot of reflection research and materials come from the service learning world. And this book right here, Service Learning Essentials has um, offered a lot of advice and great ideas. And they give an example of um, a service learning project where students do service at a um, homeless shelter. And without reflection, sometimes their conceptions about homeless people are not challenged. They don't change and sometimes are even reinforced. They're negative ideas about, about you know, why they're in this state. And so, uh, reflection can really help challenge these misconceptions. So speaking of service learning, um, they suggest that effective reflection is continuous, connected, challenging, and contextualized. So continuous meaning before, during, after an experience, um, it should be ongoing. Connected in that it builds bridges between content and experience challenging not only that you know it's difficult but that it challenges perceptions it challenges our own beliefs um, and part of college is having difficult conversations but with that you have to make sure that you are providing a supportive environment and it's kind of a balancing act between the two but if it's not a supportive environment then it can it can sort of uh, backfire and work against you and then contextualize. So in the design and setting, the reflection corresponds to the content, topics, and experiences in a meaningful way. So one of the heuristics that I like to use when I'm thinking of reflective exercises and coming up with reflective exercises is what, so what, and now what? If you ask students to reflect, say in a journal, and that's kind of our most common uh, means of reflection is a reflective journal. What they will tell you is the what, but they very rarely will tell you the so what and now what, unless you give them pretty specific prompts to encourage them to do so. So the what is just describe what happened, um, describe an understanding. The so what asks them for significance, their feelings, what skills they applied, what they learned, maybe what skills they lacked in that situation what was unexpected. And then the now what asks them to look forward. So what did you learn? What connections have you made? And what might you do next time?
So one of my, when, I, when I'm thinking about reflective activities, I love to see examples that other people have used. So, um, because that's when I, you know, I, I like the stuff like why we should do it. But to me, when I start to see examples that other people have done, it sparks some ideas for my own classes, my own content context workshops and stuff. So I'm gonna show you some examples that I've done and that I've learned from other folks that um, move sort of from more traditional to creative. So again, written journals, very common. Um, often I'll start with the what in one column and the so what in a second column. Maybe as we move through the semester, we'll add a third column for the now what, but usually I'll try and get them comfortable with, with uh, reflecting in this manner first. Uh, letters, and actually Becky and I were both talking that we've both done this. Um, asking students to write letters, it helps them articulate their thoughts, makes them think about their audience, who they're talking to. So it could be, you know, if you think about writing a letter to a grandparent versus a child, it, the content and the language, it'll be different. Um, they could write a letter to themselves in the past or the future. They could write a letter to a novice, maybe someone who's just learning or beginning to learn something that they have spent a semester or you know, their college career learning about. And again, it, it forces them to consider their audience, but also to organize their thoughts. And it creates a permanent record of their thinking. And that can be really useful later. And we'll, in a few minutes, look at some examples of, of those um, reflections over time. Um, probably most of us have done guided discussions in our class. And um, that's, you know, it's really helpful to have out loud processing with other folks. Um, sometimes, again, this is where our preconceptions can come into question. But I've also been really influenced by Susan Rock's work. She is at Columbus State. She wrote this amazing book, Minding Bodies. And she talks about the mind-body connection and how movement and motion helps our thinking. So I like to adopt activities that involve movement when, when possible. So just last week, actually, with a group of faculty, we did Walk and Talk, where they had a problem to tackle, and I sent them out for an hour-long walk. Um, and it was, it was, it's invigorating, and it, you know, kind of breaks you out of your normal sitting with a desk between you or in a classroom. And just the act of being out in motion can be really, um, really helpful for ideas. And, you know, with students in the classroom, you can take 10 minutes and say, I want you to set a timer, walk for five minutes. When the timer goes off, turn around and come back. And they'll all show up, show up after 10 minutes and, um, and then they can share what they've talked about. Another thing that I've done is stand where you stand. So you give them a question and get them and move into a corner and each corner will represent a different stance on that question. Um, and you can have them talk for a few minutes in those groups, those affinity groups, and then share with the other folks why they feel this way. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes instead of just two corners, you can have like a Likert scale where strongly agree, strongly disagree, and they can sort of file out in the center or wherever they feel. And in a supportive environment, when those folks are sharing their ideas, you'll see them start to migrate. Like, wow, that was a really compelling argument. I'm gonna start kind of move over there. So you can see just where those examples um, can help, help them think about things in a different way. Um, and then, you know, other creative activities. So when I taught a pre-service, taught pre-service teachers in a service learning course, uh, I'm sorry, in a uh, educational psychology course, one of the things that we were talking about was cultures and the cultures that they identified with. So I asked them to represent in any way they wanted um, the cultures that they identified with or that were most important to them. 
And a few of them gave me written journals, but we got poems and collages and illustrations. And um, one, one student brought in his acoustic guitar and played a song that he wrote about it. So it, the excitement on that for that assignment was way higher than your normal double journal reflection. And, um, you know, I don't know that you can do that a lot of times during a semester, but, um, but they really enjoyed that one. This is another favorite that I do, which is a storyboard. So um, what you're seeing here is a six panel storyboard. And I have done this with faculty, with grad students, with undergrad students. Um, and what they are asked to do is represent in six panels their, this, in this example, their graduate school experience. And, um, the first thing is that there will be people who say, oh, I can't draw, I'm not an artist. I usually try and have a lot of stickers around. So that some, some folks will just completely use stickers to articulate their ideas. Some will use stick figures. I use this one because um, the range of emotion in this to me is pretty exciting. Um, and the other part of this though, yes, someone just wrote cutting up magazines are helpful. Absolutely. Um, I had a, a big box of stuff that I would bring in and um, this was actually done at the end of a year long uh, fellowship with grad students on a retreat so they had a weekend to work on this and then at the end the culminating activity was each of them presenting their storyboard and one of the really interesting like, things that came out of these was that it wasn't what, what they said out loud was not always what was on the storyboard. So sometimes they would have this very um, matter of fact, you know, got into grad school, took my classes, chose a research area, think, think, think. But then when they started talking about it, all this emotion came out um, that wasn't represented on the storyboard. So it just kind of showed me how important both parts of that reflective activity was. Um, another thing that I like to do is group my maps. So this was with a graduate, um, graduate teaching assistants were taking a course design class with me. And at the, on the first day they had to, in groups, make a mind map of teaching and learning. Uh, at the end of the semester, we did, we did the same exercise again. And then I had them look at the two, at their mind map at the beginning of the semester and at the end. And what you saw at the end of the semester was more organized, there were more connections, there was more terminology that, you know, of pedagogy. And then I had them write a reflection on the changes, like how their understanding has changed and how the class understanding has changed. And so again, that was a great way for them to, for me, but also for them to see their own growth and change over time. This is very similar to our opening activity that we did today. Um, this was done in a service learning workshop at University of Georgia. And um, they just had the stack of cards with these different pictures. And just like we did at the beginning, we chose one that represented their um, their journey with service learning at that time, and then just talked about why. So you could do this, you know, these cards, I am not sure where they got these, but you could also do it, as someone said earlier, with magazines or pictures that you take. Another take on that would be to invite participants. So this was a day-long workshop that we did online. We wanted folks to have a, a break and if they could get outside, um, if they could take a walk, if they could scroll through their phone images, um, find an image on their computer that represented, uh, for this group, it was their thoughts about this coming fall semester. And so they shared a picture and then they just talked through why this represented. Um, some people went out and took a walk, some people, um, found media that they already had. Um, this was a capstone project at the end of a semester, again, uh, with graduate students in small groups. 
and I asked them to represent in a picture form or a graphic form what, um, like the, to sum up the whole semester, like what they learned, the essence of the course that semester. You can see three very different representations um, of their courses. And then they just kind of talked through, well, this is, this is what we put and this is what it represents. And this is why we chose this image to represent. And then the last one that I will talk about our cognitive wrappers. So you might be familiar with Jose Bowen's um, Teaching Naked book from 2013. And he talks about cognitive wrappers or exam wrappers. And these are things that you give to students after an exam. Um, and you tell them this is just to help you improve. So this is that what next, right? So we ask them how you prepared for this exam, what strategies you used, when you did it, um, how, how often, how long, what kind of mistakes did you make? So having them look at the exam, you know, did they tend to miss a certain type of question? And then how will you prepare differently next time? And that last one's really important because what we found is that students tend to just do more of what didn't work before because they don't know what else to do. So um, having them think about how they'll prepare differently next time, maybe talking in groups in the class, having successful students share what they did to be successful. Um, all these things can help students learn moving forward because that's what it's all about. We don't want them stuck. We want them to move forward. So I'm going to turn it over to Becky now to talk about reflection for perception. And we'll have time at the end for questions and comments and some conversation. We will. And Denise, just so that we can be sure that I am sharing and everyone is seeing, talk me through what everybody's seeing real quick so that I can be sure it's working. OK. Are you seeing the presentation? We are seeing it in edit mode. Okay, we're having that problem again. Let's try it again. Any better? Same. No. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Sorry, everyone, we had this happen earlier. Let's try one more time. Let's put this over here. Now, are you seeing now? Um, now you have to share. Okay, perfect. Only well, now I can't advance it. Here we go. Yay. All right. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, so, as Denise mentioned, um, when we got together to talk about this initially, we, we were thinking about it from slightly different perspectives. And I think probably that's our academic domains. Um, if you don't know, I am a, or was a music educator. I'm in faculty development now, but I spent 20 years teaching music at various levels, middle school, high school, and higher education. And so um, when I think about reflective practice in the classroom, I am usually thinking about perception. What are people able to perceive? And the reason that I say that is because, for example, provided that you do not have a hearing disability, if I play a song for you, we all hear the same thing, but we may perceive extraordinarily different things based upon experience, training, um, prior exposure to similar stimuli. It depends upon our lived experience, what we are able to perceive. And in a classroom, uh, particularly as a music teacher, we can actually help students learn to perceive things that even though they heard the exact same thing, they didn't initially. And another really good analogy is um, every single person in my family is some sort of an artist. Um, we have theater, music, and visual art. My father is a visual artist, and um, I grew up doing a lot of that with him, um, and I draw and paint, and every once in a while I would get stuck on something that I could not manage to depict the way that I wanted to, and I remember calling him really frustrated because, you know, you paint background to foreground, and I was trying to paint the bark on a relatively close-up pine tree, 
and I could not get it right. And I called my father and I said, dad, help me. How do you paint pine tree bark? And he said, paint what you see, which is not at all helpful. <laughs> but his point was, in order to paint something, in order to depict it, you have to be able to actually perceive everything that you're seeing. We all see the same thing, or we make the assumption that we do, but you have to be able to perceive it. So the content of this is, you know, how do we help students to perceive more deeply? So as Denise discussed, you know, what is a reflective practice? And I'm going to have to move this because I cannot see my, my own screen. Hang on one second, here we go. What is a reflective practice? Anything that causes critical thinking about our behaviors, our attitudes, our beliefs, our values, our feelings, our knowledge, and our learning processes. Basically, anything that causes students to stop and consider thinking or learning. And if you think about the formative experiences that our students that are coming to us go through in high school, this is something they are not frequently asked to do. They're usually told what to know and that the goal is the grade on the test, as opposed to the goal being the process of how to think and how you get um, to someplace different than than where you are now. Um, so asking them to consider and stop and reflect is important because when they did a national survey of all the major employers across the, the US, what employers were most interested in having students coming out of undergraduate programs be able to do, it was things like think critically, be creative, generate solutions to formerly unencountered problems, be able to articulately communicate with a wide and broad audience. It's the things that don't have necessarily anything to do with the actual um, domain content. Why are reflective practices beneficial? Well, they make learning more meaningful for students. Quite literally, they make learning experiences more meaningful. They are related to mindfulness, which I'll speak about in just a moment. They help to bring students into the present moment. Our entire culture and society has an issue, most of us, with anxiety. And anxiety is usually worrying about something that is not actually in the present environment. So anything that we can do to get students to stop and reflect on the present moment, the present environment is a positive thing. It helps students to be aware Again, there's that idea of perception, aware of where they are and how they're feeling. And it causes students to articulate things that they may not ever articulate in other settings. Why, uh, uh, continuing on, why are they beneficial? It assists students, reflective practices assist students in being aware of their thinking and learning. It helps them to metacognate, to think about their thinking. It, they, these activities value the process of thinking and learning versus the end product. And they provide a basis for critical inquiry that values many forms of knowledge, including emotional intelligence. So the connection between reflection and mindfulness, I'm sure most of you have heard the term mindfulness. It is the quality or state of being conscious or aware of something. A mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while acknowledging feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. Mindfulness practice, they use that word in the very similarly to the way that they use it in yoga, it is something that you have to practice. But the more you practice it, the better at doing it you become. So one technique that I use with students is stop, which is one, and all of these things, typically I would program after we had been doing something in sustained fashion, particularly if it was academically very challenging, or when I would see that I was losing my audience, or when I could tell that they were frustrated because something was challenging, they were having difficulty with it. One, stop what you're doing. Two, take a few deep breaths to center yourself and bring yourself fully into the present moment. Three, Observe what's actually going on in your present moment. And then four, 
proceed with your doing and think, okay, what now? So let's take just a minute and do that together. And usually when I do it with students, I'll give them some prompts. I'll say, what do you hear right now? Where are your feet connecting to the earth right now? Where can you feel your heartbeat right now? Is there anywhere in your body that you feel stressed out or tension? Prompts like that to get them to really reflect and think. And then when we get to the, okay, let's now proceed with what we were doing, the question becomes, what is most important next? Where should I be focusing my attention next? Some other examples of reflective activities, um, Denise mentioned letters. I often would have students write letters to themselves. Things like, okay, we just finished this unit. How do you think it went? And what kind of advice can you give yourself going into the next unit to improve anything that you did not feel positive about in this particular experience? Talk to yourself, your future self. What advice can you give you? Um, I've also used critical listening. And this is something, by the way, that I have used in all sorts of classes, not just music classes. I've also used it in faculty development. I'm gonna use it here. What is critical listening? Uh, it is a form of reflection and helps to center and bring people into the present moment. It works really well as a brain break after doing sustained difficult activities. And part of the reason that critical listening does bring people into the present moment has to do with neuromusicology. And it is because music, unlike any other stimuli, quite literally, unlike anything else on the face of the earth, engages all areas of the brain simultaneously. Both hemispheres, there's activity on MRI and fMRI, both hemispheres, all of the lobes, even the brain stem, which typically handles only autonomous functions like heartbeat and body temperature. It literally engages the entire brain. And for that reason, it is very difficult to think about anything else when you are actually focused and critically listening to music. For that reason, you can't worry and you can't be casting back and thinking of things in the past. It, it prevents that because of what is happening in the brain. Um, another really good reason that this works is because it asks participants to consider thoughts and feelings simultaneously um, at the same time. And then finally, because it's fun. If you've ever been to a seminar or a clinic or been in a class yourself and the professor used music for a moment, even if just a moment, everybody's mood becomes elevated. So I'm going to play something for you. And I would like for you to, number one, turn up your volume so that you're sure that you can hear clearly. Number two, listen without writing anything down. Do not take notes, do not write, just listen. And then I'm gonna ask you a few questions following each song. The questions are going to be things like, what do you think this song is about? Why did the composer write it, do you think? How did it make you feel? Questions like that. So here is the first example. I want to make sure you're not seeing this as I play it. Denise, nod at me and let me know that the screen is not changing. Okay. Good. It is 
as long as she fell as our hair came down among the fields of gold. Will you stay with me? Will you be my love among the fields of folly? We'll forget the sun in his jealous sky as we lie in fields of gold. Take a moment to put into the chat, and Denise, I can't see it at the moment, so if you could read some of that out for me. Um, put into the chat, number one, what do you think, what, what's the song about? Loss, ballad, love, nostalgia, mortality, sadness, love despite mortality, mindfulness, love and peace, Falling in love, progression of love. Nostalgia. I like that one. Yeah, uh, being carefree, sentiment, a sentimental reflection of a love of a lost love. Deep thought, memory, someone is leaving, relationship that's over. Looking back at the first days of intense love, hope, growing older. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Letting go over pain and anxiety. Um, sounds like a farewell to a loved one spoken sung by someone who is dying. So those are all really interesting and we got a really broad array of different things, which speaks, I think, to, to one of the initial points, which is we all heard the same thing, but we perceive very different things. And considering what we perceived and what other people perceived from the same stimulus is a, a very important activity, particularly for students. So if I were to ask you, why do you think the composer wrote it? Your answers would probably be pretty similar to, to um, what you said the song was about. Does anybody have anything different um, from what you wrote initially in regard to the question, why do you think the composer wrote this? Um, do you want me to do the comments again? Yeah. Okay. Um, so someone wrote, and Jeff Burson, and this was my experience too, that never really been able to make out most of the words except for fields of barley. Um, 
um, someone, Jennifer said, we have the choice to feel emotions and escape routine, enjoying life outside of a routine like sun and nature. Um, let's say looking back on a relationship, dealing with death, um, expressing feelings in the moment. Okay, and so let's let's kind of get at the central thing here, which is, and, and again, the answers will probably be be similar or at least linked. How did that song make you feel? At peace, relaxed, calm, wistful, chill, relaxed but sad. I felt that one too. Calm and quiet, melancholy, terrible. Oh, uh, I rolled my eyes. <laughs> Um, calm, like a good fishing day. I like that. Here and now, sleepy, wanted to sing along. Um, seen him in concert many times, reminded me of those times. I like that. So it brought you back to a different moment. Um, deja vu, nostalgic. Okay, so now we've got one for you to compare to the one you just heard. So same instructions, don't write anything down, just listen, and then I'll ask you the same or similar questions at the end.
You can tell the sun in his jealous sky when we walk in fields of gold. When we walk in fields of gold. obviously the same song, but performed by a different artist. Did this artist's interpretation of that song make you think anything different about what the song is actually about? So someone said they like this one better. Someone said, sorry, but depressing. Um, lover's reflection of life, different situations in life. Some go, some come, some enjoy, some suffer. Um, could hear the words clearer than with stings. Um, unpleasant melancholy, but I heard the lyrics this time and it was much more poetic and creatively interpreted. Um, calm, serene, peaceful, beautiful voice, mesmerized by the range of her voice. The song to me is sad. Um, someone said oddly angry, I think because it's sting song and one of my favorites. <laughs> um, I want to rhyme Bob Marley with Fields of Barley. <laughs> More ethereal and less sad nostalgia. Similar core feelings, but their impact to my perception are more uplifting. So very, you know, more depressing, less depressing, interesting. Yeah. So again, a really broad range of things perceived, even though we're all hearing the exact same thing. So if you had not heard that one before, and, and let me back up and say, I've even done this particular one with middle school students, and you would be amazed at the deeply perceptive things that even middle school students can say about things like this. And part of the reason that they like the activity is because they're not often asked, you know, how, <laughs> what did you hear? How did it make you feel? What do you think about how that made you feel? Um, how are you feeling right this moment? How are you feeling differently in this moment than you were before we began this activity? And you'll probably notice that if you really were intently focusing, it did take you kind of out of wherever you were before you did it. And obviously this is a compare and contrast activity and you don't have to do that. And you do not have to use something that long either. It can be a small snippet of something and it doesn't have to obviously be anything melancholy either. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with that, that was Eva Cassidy. She um, passed away, I think, when she was 33, um, some time ago. And she never experienced the fame that occurred after her death. It was actually after her death that her agent began releasing recordings. Um, and she became famous when they played one of her pieces, one of her um, uh, selections on, I, I wanna say British radio and their phone lines blew up and then they began producing the albums and releasing them. Sting actually, um, I heard an interview with him in which he was asked, hey, have you heard Eva Cassidy's interpretation of your song? And he said, yeah, it's amazing. I can't believe what she did with it. So for, for most of the audiences that, that I have um, done this activity with, many of them will say, I didn't realize that it truly was a song about death until listening to Eva Cassidy's version. And the kind of critical line in it is at the end, um, you know, it's, it's definitely nostalgic and retrospective. They're looking back, see the children run, you know, as the sun goes down, as you lie in fields of gold. Um, and there are actually three different voices, three different perspectives in it that you don't really get in, in the Sting version. So pause for a moment and let's do the stop activity again. Stop what you're doing. Take a moment to take a few breaths. Observe your environment and yourself, your physical self. What do you hear? What are you feeling? Where are you feeling those things physically?
And now for the what next, consider, do you feel, and this is something you can put in the chat, do you feel different than you did before we began the activity? More relaxed, more restful, hopeful, more present, slowed down, lighter, more engaged, inspired, centered, present. Um, someone says slightly more anxious, feeling different, makes me miss home, England and France, less frazzled, calmed my brain squirrels. Brain squirrels, I like that. Some sad, nostalgic. Yeah, and actually there's a good deal of research um, about mindfulness practices and the fact that it can, the person that said slightly more anxious, it can cause anxiety, particularly if it's not something that you do frequently, because sometimes it's uncomfortable to look at and acknowledge kind of where we are literally and what is happening within us in the present moment. It can indeed cause some, some anxiety. Um, and I will just share with you a little bit here um, that I, I have tried yoga so many times and it is just radically difficult for me because I have a hard time calming my mind down enough to actually do that without thinking constantly. Um, very verbal person. And so I, I literally have to practice, literally practice mindfulness things to be able to to actually do it. And it, it, it is uncomfortable. It is, particularly if, if it's hard for you, it can be uncomfortable. But I hope that you can see that, you know, it was a, it was a reflective activity that asked you to try to perceive things as you were hearing them. And the stop activity is a reflective activity that asks you to try to perceive self in a way that when we're working, when we are teaching, when we are running around, we, we don't do that very often because we don't have the bandwidth to do it in the middle of things, but it's beneficial to stop and do that and see, you know, what, how, how can we reflect on what is happening with us right now? And asking students to do that is very beneficial for them as well. Becky, um, Amanda has asked if you have students that push back on this type of activity. Oh, of course, absolutely. Yeah, but usually I'll tell them, hey, I'm gonna ask you to do something that's a little out of the ordinary and you, you might think this is silly, but here's why I'm asking you to do this. I'm asking you to do this because I want to know blank or because I'm trying to achieve blank. And usually if I frame it in a, you know, this is, if I'm tilted, if I frame it in a, this is why I am asking you to do this activity, usually there aren't very many that push back. The vast majority of them, in fact, I've done um, a lot of informal surveying, you know, halfway through the semester, how are things going? What things have you enjoyed? What things have you not enjoyed? Overwhelmingly, um, the things that they comment on are these sort of reflective activities um, in a positive way, particularly if they involve music, but yeah. So I, I think technically 1150 is when we're supposed to end. Denise, do you want to run a chat for discussion or conversation? Yeah, so um, if you all have questions or comments, you can also unmute your microphone if you would like to, um, to talk. I saw when I, during some of this, there were folks sharing some of the things that they've done in their classrooms, and, and I love that idea, and so it kind of went by so fast. If anyone would like to unmute, we have seven minutes left. Um, you know, I would love to hear what you all are doing that you have found to be particularly effective. Uh, hey, this is Bill Hamilton. Hi, Hi. everybody. Can you all hear me? Mm-hmm. Hey, so I'm over at the College of Nursing at Augusta University, and I just finished um, a project with about 12 BSN students, um, and we did a study um, using meditation and self student self-efficacy assessments. We did a pre and post study, and I did some work on this before, and the literature is suggesting that Meditation and mindfulness will actually increase um, student self-efficacy 
which in nursing is really important. And the results have, were not statistically significant, but we did see some upticks on some SS, um, SSC self-assessment. So I just think that it's, that mindfulness is real important, but the critical reflection is really, I think sort of the accelerant for the mindfulness to do that. But I just think it's great. I'm still trying to figure out how to do it and, and use it in my classroom. But um, I think it's something that the literature absolutely supports it on uh, teaching and learning and the outcome. So thank you for doing this, this is great. Oh, thanks for sharing. On, on the heels of that, um, if you are interested in some literature regarding how the use of music can help nursing students, yeah. Um, in a service field, feel free to email me and I'll send you some. I'll do that. I'll, I'll make it a note. Okay. Good. Thank you. And actually, I have a colleague here whose primary area of research is mindfulness, and I'm sure she could send you some things too. It was great, though, when we started doing meditation, you know, deep breathing before each class, students were it, looking at the way that the response of the students was amazing because they were like, what, wait, wait, hold on. You know, they're like freaking out because they've never had, it. but after we did it for the whole semester, they sort of, they're like, you forgot something. <laughs> oh, okay, hold on, so. And you can ease them into it. Um, I, oh, taught, yeah. I taught a knitting circle to fourth and fifth graders a couple of years ago. Yeah. And the person I was doing it with, her research was in mindfulness. And so we started with a very, very short, very, you know, small, but focusing uh, mindfulness activity. And, you know, there was a lot of like, uh, mind eye rolling and, and giggles at first, but same thing by the third session, they were like, wait, are we going to do the thing? So, you know, I ease them into it. Somebody wrote, we're going back to a very different teaching environment after the pandemic. Maybe we can learn even more from our students. Yeah. Linda, I absolutely agree. Um, Linda wrote, knitting can be very contemplative. Most activities um, can, depending on how you approach them. I have personally, um, in order to keep my mind from wandering during this type of thing, I'll often make uh, little origami cranes or I've got all kinds of fidget things to <laughs> mess with to, to keep my fingers occupied so that my mind can stay focused. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I also saw just in the chat, someone said that it's especially important for students with mental health disorders. And I really want to remind everyone that meditation can actually make some anxiety disorders worse and can cause panic attacks. So if you are going to do this, please allow students to leave the classroom at any time during it. Um, I think Shamala, please tell me if I'm saying your name correctly. I'm sure I'm- Shamala, Shamala. Shamala, okay. Kamala. Shamala said that she lets students leave the classroom at any time. And I think that's a really good practice. But just so everyone's aware, it can cause panic attacks. I think that's a really good point. And maybe even, you know, at, at the beginning, first day of class, sort of talking about what you're doing, what you plan to do and why, and maybe give them an opportunity to come to you privately or email or whatever they feel comfortable with to, you know, if, if, if they feel like that would help them. Um, because you're absolutely right. It, all these things, you know, when I was talking about the, the walk and talk, I saw something kind of scroll by, you know, students with mobility issues. It's, it's, there's so much that we need to be mindful of and we need to think about how to include and not exclude people. And so, you know, the, and I have found that just being open and honest from the very beginning and helping people understand why I'm doing the things that I'm doing, but also that part of it is making them feel comfortable and safe and supported. And so giving them an opportunity to talk to me face-to-face, -face, email, you know, whatever makes them feel most comfortable to let me know what, um, what will help them feel the most supported in the class. And we can, you know, almost always find accommodations. We can always find accommodations. 
Yeah, I, I liken it a little bit to um, group work or group activities, which uh, for profound introverts like myself can be very painful and difficult. But I work in faculty development, and so I go to clinics and seminars all the time and need to engage in small groups with people I don't know all the time. And when I began this work, that was incredibly profoundly painful for me. I hated it. Um, but the more practice I got doing that, the easier it became to the extent that now I actually enjoy it. Um, but it, it took some it took some time. I'm, I'm the same way. <laughs> I'm the same way. Well, I see that the it's a 12 o'clock now, and I just want to, um, I see that Charles has written a comment that I think is kind of a nice one to wrap this up. He wrote, regarding resistance, be mindful of your expectations when implementing these exercises. Sometimes that resistance can be a great teaching moment or discussion. And I think that's true. And again, I, I think it just calls back to that supportive environment in your classroom that the students know that you care about them and their learning and that you know sometimes they will be challenged and they may feel uncomfortable but as long as we do it in a supportive way um, hopefully they'll still they'll still learn um, so thank you everyone thanks becky for doing this with me this was fun um, and you know i think let me put in the chat a link to our webinars uh, registration. The next one is on June 18th next, that's about nine days from now. And it is on free technology tools to teach your way. Uh, very popular, we've had a lot of folks register for that one. So we're excited about that. Um, again, apologize for the weird email this morning, but you now have the link for feedback. So we would welcome your feedback um, on this webinar and what we can do to make it better next time. So thanks everyone.